Even when a conspiracy theory says absolutely nothing true about the object of the theory, if it catches on, it says something true about the anxieties and the experiences of the people who believe it. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Jesse Walker. He's the books editor at Reason Magazine and Reason.com, and he's the author of the great new book, The United States of Paranoia, A Conspiracy Theory, which is out from HarperCollins. Jesse, thanks for talking to us. Well, I'm glad to talk to you. At the heart of this book is conspiracy theory in American politics. Is it a new phenomenon? Is it right wing? Is it left wing? Where, where are we with conspiracy theory? Uh, uh, political paranoia and conspiracy theories in particular have been a part of uh, the United States since before there was a United States, going back to the colonial era across the political spectrum, left wing, right wing, and the center. Um, it's, we're not just talking about people on the fringes. Uh, or outsiders, but often people at the very heart of American power. So uh, talk uh, John Quincy Adams, for instance. Yeah. What, what was his uh, bet noir? Well, he, he comes up a couple times in the book, but the one that really interests people uh, is that he was an anti-Mason. He was uh, afraid of the influence of Freemasonry uh, in the 1832 election. He made a comment that the most important thing isn't whether uh, Mr. Jackson or Mr. Clay is elected, but uh, what we can do about the Masonic institution, the Masonic power. What was he so worried about with the Masons? The anti-Masonic impulse comes from a number of different directions. I think in his case it was a sort of sincere fear of the, uh, the, the influence that people meeting behind closed doors could have. I mean, I mean it's the same sort of impulse that had people um, afraid of party politics at the beginning of the, uh, of the United States. Uh, but of course, the different people were uh, jumped onto anti-Masonry for different reasons. Andrew Jackson, he was president, he was a Mason. If you were against Jackson, this was obviously one way to direct um, opposition. In the cradle of anti-Masonry, uh, upstate New York, there was a very famous incident where somebody, William Morgan, said he was going to uh, reveal Masonic secrets and then was apparently kidnapped and killed. And that led to charges of a cover-up, and this was in a context in which, I mean, some historians have gone back and shown that actually in a lot of these communities there was heavy overlap between people who were involved with Freemasonry and people who were involved with, um, you know, the higher uh, reaches of local society. Is in a democracy, are conspiracy theories more active in the sense that, you know, we're supposed to have open government or transparent government, and so are people more worried about kind of dark, shadowy forces directing things? I don't know if it, I think it's a different kind of worry. I mean, obviously in monarchies, there's always the court right. intrigue, yeah. you know, I mean, and there's a long history of, you know, the. English being afraid of Spanish conspiracies right. and vice versa. You know, often there were really were spies, you yeah. know. But I think that there's a different flavor in a democratic uh, society. What are some of the other uh, conspiracy theories, kind of the, the real classics that you talk about in the book? Well, one of my favorites was the as attempted assassination of Andrew Jackson in 1835. Uh, Jackson himself believed that uh, a senator from Mississippi had uh, arranged for uh, or attempted to arrange a hit on him. Um, some of the uh, pro-Jackson people jumped on this. At the same time, anti-Jackson people were claiming it was a false flag attack, that uh, he had arranged for somebody to fire at him, but that's why the pistols had failed, was because he just wanted public sympathy. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, uh, when the uh, riots uh, in the mid-60s were hitting, was convinced that uh, the communists were behind it, or strongly suspected that the communists were behind it. He asked his cabinet for uh, evidence to back this up. The attorney general told him the evidence wasn't there. He was basically keep looking. Uh, so I mean, it, it happens, you know, throughout American history. Um, now, part of the insight of the book is that you know that conspiracy theories, as you were saying, are not fringe phenomena. They're actually at the center of American politics. What do we gain by looking at conspiracy theories, or if not taking the the conspiracy uh, seriously? at least looking at why do people keep returning to conspiracy as a way of explaining things? Well, I think that um, even when a conspiracy theory says absolutely nothing true about the object of the theory, if it catches on, it says something true about the anxieties and the experiences of the people who believe it. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you look, for example, uh, when back in the 1980s, there was a spate of you know, belief that you know, white doctors were injecting black babies with AIDS, right? I mean, this is not true, right? I mean, I'm not going to claim it's true. It's not. Uh, but this comes at, you know, it, you can see how this could catch on among people who've had to deal with a long history of abusive or high-handed treatment from white doctors. Um, and why this sort of, uh, you would sort of reach for something that 
mythically expresses, you know, a day-to-day -day experience. Uh, something similar also would be a lot of New World Order theories. Um, you could see how uh, people who feel like they're losing uh, control over their lives would be attracted to ideas about a cabal plotting against American liberty and sovereignty and so on. What is the relevance of the book today? What does, what does it offer a reader besides, I mean, a, an absolutely rollicking and interesting and kind of, uh, you know, a gimlet eyed view of American history. I mean, I think people will find it fascinating uh, for that. But, you know, what is its relevance to contemporary American readers? No, well, I mean, first, I do try to make it very entertaining so that people could read it and enjoy it and get yeah. nothing out of it. But um, I, I think I'm trying to provide a toolkit. I'm, I'm trying to show these stories that keep getting told again and again. Um, uh, I mean, sometimes the same narratives with different names plugged in, um, and why they've come up in the past, um, uh, and what kind of in the circumstances they've come up under, so that when they turn up again, you won't say, oh, geez, birthers, that's something that we've never heard of before. You know, actually, you know, there is precedent for this. Uh, how did you come to get interested in conspiracy theory as a as a subject of inquiry? Well, I guess I in my teens I, I was reading um, books about you know I mean actual sane, well documented books about abuses by the CIA and the FBI and so forth. I mean often drawing on the investigations that were done in the 1970s, and these were often on the same shelves as somewhat kookier books by you know people like Fletcher Prouty, you know making these sort of stranger claims. I started reading those actually at first thinking you know well this will be more um, you know more grist for the mill, and then I start saying you know actually the level of evidence here is not quite as good, um, but it was interesting in, in its own right. Um, they were interesting as stories. Um, and around the same time, actually, I, I uh, discovered, you know, some things like, you know, the Church of the Subgenius, you know, books by Robert Anton Wilson, uh, uh, people who were, I, I, in the book I call them the, the ironic style of American paranoia, people who are interested in conspiracy theories, not so much as something to be espoused or debunked, but as just a sort of great mutant mythos that you can have fun with and just sort of build these great stories and, and just sort of find what metaphors or laughs or insights are, are inside them. And, and, and I, in, in some ways, I'm, I'm trying to extend that tradition here. I mean, I'm looking at these stories that people have told, and, and I'm, I'm not making up a conspiracy theory of my own, but I'm saying, what can, what can we unearth from these stories? Do you think, um, you know, now with revelations about NSA, uh, you know, massive NSA surveillance and other kinds of intelligence state operations going on, are we at the beginning of another phase, like in the 70s when the Church Commission hearings and whatnot really unearth? for the first time and gave documented facts, you know, or evidence that there was a lot of spying going on, a lot of surveillance, a lot of conspiratorial work on the part of government or quasi-government actors. Are we going to go through another cycle of, uh, you know, really kind of airing conspiratorial laundry? Oh, I hope so. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm all in favor of investigative journalism and congressional probes that bring to light genuine abuses of power. The flip side of the NSA thing is that uh, we're also seeing an intense paranoia on the part of the government. Um, I mean, this war on leakers that we're seeing right now is, uh, it, it, you're sort of, at any given time, you know, there is an enemy that's sort of being, uh, that, that's inspiring people at the center of power, or, or more than one enemy. And right now, there's this intense fear of, its, of themselves, of, of itself, of what will people working for the government turn around and tell other people. And this is, um, in some ways, uh, a more interesting paranoia than the paranoia of people who are afraid of the NSA. I mean, people at the center of power are constantly having their own fears. Um, in this case, possibly justified, although I, th I think the leaks are great, but I think um, it's, uh, it, it's, you know, more are probably coming. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. Jesse Walker, the author of The United States of Paranoia, a Conspiracy Theory, uh, buy it now. It's an incredible read. Jesse, thanks for talking to us. Thank you. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.